OK, I guess we'll get started. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us again for uh, another school reopening call. Uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat box. Everybody, please mute your, your phones and computers. And um, Dr. Morse, I see you're there, so we'll we'll start off with with your updates. Thank you. All right. Let me share my screen. All right. You can see in here, okay? Yeah, I can. <clears throat> All right. So I'm going to start like usual. So I'll just ask if you can all mute your phones or computers for me. That would be great. Um, we'll start by going over questions that have come up over the week frequently, things that um, we've gotten calls or questions about. Um, before I do that, I'll go through our county numbers. Um, I'm continuously trying to tweak this so that it's most useful for you guys. Um, one thing that we've gotten more aware of is that the handling of your student symptoms has to do with your uh, community incidents. And so um, I really labeled this clearly as to how to handle that and um, which counties we would consider with a bit higher community incidence and therefore you'd want to have your students get more health care evaluation or testing prior to return to school. So um, we'll send this out to everybody after our talk today. Um, I'm trying to see. I'm not very good with Excel, but I'm trying to do better. Um, but this first bracket here is our lowest risk counties. And again, I listed people by both percent positivity and then separately by cases because most counties are different. They might have higher cases, <clears throat> but lower positivity. So really anyone in these groups are pretty low risk. Um, so we got Lake, Gladwin, Crawford, Kalkaska, Masaki, Osceola, Oceana, uh, Mason, Gratiot, Macosta, Roscommon, Montcalm, New Echo, Clinton, Wexford, Manistee, Clare, and Aranac are all under 3% positivity the, in these last seven days. I left what you were the previous week here in, in parentheses, so you can kind of see as a comparison. Um, Lake and Crawford, haven't had any cases. Um, oh, Shannon's better. Look at that. They were at 1.4. Now they're at 0.7. Can you mute your computer or phone, please? All right. And then down into the the next level of risk, um, the state of Michigan on average is around 3%. Isabella County is at 6%. Again, we've really looked at this. It really is related to an outbreak that's still ongoing related to CMU. Um, we are not seeing cases that we feel would increase risks for the K through 12 schools. We are really watching this, um, but at this time, we're really feeling that this is isolated to the university at this point. Um, so Oceana, Manistee, Kalkaska, Roscommon, and Osceola have, um, slightly higher cases per million. But again, given the population, cases per million in these instances are usually less than one a day. Um, but this is still considered medium risk and still considered um, appropriate to have in-person school. This line here and below is where we start to consider it a bit higher risk in the community for spread. So if you have students calling in with symptoms, if you are listed in this at all, um, we would recommend if your students have symptoms, following that algorithm on page seven in the toolkit, 
that those students should have some kind of evaluation before returning to school. So we don't have anybody with this high of positivity. <clears throat> with these, as I actually then in parentheses besides the county, um, put the average number of actual cases per day, just to give you an idea. Because again, like if you look at Wexford, it's 21.6 cases per million, but that's less, you know, it's about one case per day. So just to give you an idea, because we do have such low um, population counties, <clears throat> it may look like we're getting a high amount of cases, but really it's not that many. So I just wanted to put it into perspective for you. So again, unless we're seeing outbreaks or a lot of cases within the school, we're still okay to continue with school in person in these counties, but if you have six students, it is best to have them get tested um, or seek medical care prior to return to school. Um, so this would be, and again, I know some of these had lower percentages, um, but because of the number of cases, we would recommend this. I'd be Wexford, Gladwin, Macosta, Mason, Montcalm, Gratiot, Clare, Nuego, Misaki, and Clinton County. Um, Clinton has seen some increases recently and we're keeping a really close eye on that. Um, so Aranac is now in the high risk. Again, that is one case. <laughs> so one case per day on average. So just to keep that aware, and we've looked at that, you know, it's mainly been um, some cases that occurred at a workplace that was in a household. So, you know, we're taking all of this into consideration, but again, it is a very low population county. Um, it makes it look like it's this huge jump not been that dramatic. Um, so when we're looking at counties that are in this risk group, um, you know, in this situation, we would not recommend it, but this might be where we might start suggesting um, some added risk modification, um, like maybe having some students go to online education for a while so we can decrease the amount of kids in school, things like that. Uh, but again, for Aranac at this point, we're not recommending that because it really hasn't been that big of an increase overall. Um, it's more of a math, you know, a math situation right now. And those cases have been really isolated to, um, to a workplace in a household. Isabella County is way up at the tippity top in terms of cases per million, um, averaging about 12 cases a day. Um, it is declining. Again, these are all really related to the outbreak at CMU, and we really are not seeing spillover into any populations right now that we feel will put a risk at the K through 12 schools, but we are watching that very, very closely. So again, if your schools are in any of these categories here, um, if you have sick kids, it is best to have them evaluated for COVID prior to returning to school. Um, hopefully this makes sense. Um, I will talk about this in our about some alternative ways you can deal with sick kids that um, might be a little more clear. It will lead to potentially having more kids out and more kids needing evaluation, but I just want you guys to feel comfortable. And really, these are recommendations for you. It's not the rules. You need to do what you feel comfortable with. Um, like I said, we'll get this out to you. We'll make sure that all of our staff has it as well so that if you have questions, uh, they have it available. So I will go on to other topics now. Um, just some clarifications about face coverings. Um, we've had some questions about um, what is acceptable, what isn't acceptable, what is recommended. Um, so from a public health standpoint, the best thing is, is that everyone who's indoors or who is outdoors and can't stay six feet apart from each other should be wearing face covering as much as possible. So the rules say, so the minimum you have to do to play it safe by the, the state rules is that um, if you're in phase four, your staff has to wear face coverings all the time except for meals. Um, all your students need to wear them all on, on the transportation. Um, they need to be worn in hallways and common areas. They must be worn in the classrooms by sixth through 12th graders. And then K through five um, must wear them unless 
They are remaining in their classes all through the day and they don't come in contact with any other students. So they're not eating lunch with other students. They're not going to recess with other students. They're not having gym with other students. Um, they're not having specials with other students or anything else. So that's what the rules say for phase four. For phase five, which we do have some counties in phase five, um, those are all strongly recommended. But again, we with public health do definitely recommend that to happen as well. So just to make some clarifications there, um, some clarifications as well regarding face coverings and determination of close contacts and exposure risks. So face coverings worn by the lay public definitely reduce the risks of spread of COVID, but they do not eliminate it. I put this picture here just because it's a reminder that we don't all wear our face covering properly. We don't all have face coverings that are 100% effective. Um, so we can't rely on them as a guaranteed prevention from preventing COVID from leaving a sick person's body and prevention from keeping COVID from entering a healthy person's body. So for that reason, we do not take face use into consideration when we're determining who a close contact is. I know that's frustrating, but I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of that because I know that's caused some confusion. So if a sick person is wearing a face covering or the people around them are wearing face covering, we don't take that into consideration as we're determining who is a contact. It doesn't mean, and I've tried to put that here at the bottom. Oh, it's kind of cutting off my screen here, but um, I try to put a little bit of verbiage here because we don't want people to think, well, then why am I even bothering wearing a face mask if I'm still going to have to be in quarantine? Well, face masks help protect us against illness. Facial distancing help protect us from getting sick. Quarantine is one other tool to help us prevent spreading illness. We do all of these things to protect us. So if you're wearing your facial covering, you're less likely to get sick, but we still need to do those other things to help protect people from getting sick. Um, healthcare workers wearing medical PPE is a bit different, and I'm gonna talk about that because that question has come up as well. But I just wanted to make that clear that we still have to consider everybody who is in that in that perimeter, you know, within six feet or close to it as a close contact, regardless of face covering use. Um, I just wanted to show these pictures just to kind of show what we're talking about. So this is a non-masked person coughing, and it just shows, you know, the cough actually goes up to 12 feet away. Um, there really is no great data to say at six feet you're fine. Um, and so that's why really six feet is just kind of a guesstimate. Um, the virus doesn't just stop at six feet. So when you cough, when you sneeze, it's going to go further. Um, these are just some simulations. This is with like a folded handkerchief used as a mask, which is if you look on the CDC, like it'll show you how to make one like that. So these are the spread of droplets or aerosols with that kind of a mask. So it still goes about one foot three inches in six seconds. If you were to follow it out, you know, the aerosol will go further and stay in the air longer. This is your more typical cloth mask. Um, you know, obviously still a lot of it does get in the air um, and would become an aerosol, but it doesn't go as far. Um, they didn't have images, but they also studied an elastic, like stretchy material bandana, and the spread of that was about three and a half feet. So I just wanted to show that that's why we can't count on our face coverings as 100% protection. Plus, again, like I showed earlier, you know, a lot of us don't always wear our masks perfectly all the time. So we had a question come up about a first responder. Um, who had an exposure during their work time, and then it caused some confusion during their second job, which was being a teacher. So I was asked to just clarify that. Um, if a healthcare provider or a first responder or anyone working in those types of field, um, if they were exposed to a COVID infected individual and they're wearing medical grade surgical procedural mask or surgical mask, 
um, or a respirator like an N95, and they've been educated how to wear it properly, and if the sick person was not wearing a mask themselves, if they were wearing proper eye protection, it's like a face shield, um, and if, heaven forbid, they had to do what we call an aerosol generating procedure, which could be intubating somebody, um, in that case, if they were wearing full PPE, everything that they need, um, if they're doing all of that correctly, then the risk of them being exposed is so low that we do not consider them a contact and they don't need to be in quarantine. So if you have, you know, if you happen to have an employee who also is a volunteer firefighter or works weekends as an EMT or anything like that, if you have any questions or concerns about that, let us know. Um, but so there are exceptions to those things and it, it's very specific. Um, we don't expect you to remember all this. Just remember how to get a hold of us and we'll help you work through it. Questions about appropriate face coverings have included this type of mask specifically. So this little plastic shield that is in no way really securing anything. Um, this is not an appropriate face covering. So the definition of a face covering is the state has it stated as cloth material <clears throat> that covers the nose, nose and mouth and is secured securely to the head um, or wrapped around the lower face. Um, the state also though says that you can use clear masks as needed for communication. So like this clear mask would be acceptable um, because the plastic covers the nose and mouth while it wraps around and there's foam creating a seal. Some of them have fabric around the edges. So again, that material is, is covering the nose and mouth well, whereas this is not covering the nose and mouth well. It's just, it's basically a tiny, a teeny tiny floating. To me, this is like a drool catcher. I mean, it's not really, it's not really there to block germs. So these are completely unacceptable. <clears throat> We also had a report from one of our nurses. A school had said that a student falsely claimed that they were infected with COVID and you know, calls to mom and to the health department confirmed that the child was not infected. Um, so I just wanted to bring your attention to that. I'm sure some of you thought about that happening um, and have kind of thought about what to do with that. So I would, oh, somebody's not on me. Can you guys please check and make sure you're all on mute for me? That'd be great, thanks. Um, so obviously that is a huge issue. So I would encourage you if you've not already to have a really clear policy and make it very well known to your student and your staff if you're worried about them that you'll have a zero tolerance on that, that if they falsely um, report having COVID or being a close contact with someone with COVID, there will be serious punishment or repercussions because that obviously will cause you a lot of um, hardship and stress. Um, so we've had some questions and, and clarifications needed about close contacts. Um, so again, like I just mentioned, there really is no magic number with the six feet. That's what's in everything. Um, in our toolkit, it does say that the close contacts are most often defined as six feet um, for at least 15 minutes, but every case is different and we need to look at each case. Um, so if someone's sitting at six and a half feet for an hour a day for six days while someone's contagious, that frequency and duration may be enough for us to say, gosh, we really should have that person in quarantine. Um, the other thing would be, you know, if there's any sharing of items, any touching, hugging, things like that. I mean, all those things are important. So we've had some discussions where it's just, you know, if there's, if it's, if that desk is six foot one inches apart, then there's just not much discussion about it being a close contact. So I just want to have a discussion about, um, you know, working with us on close contacts and contact tracing. Um, I'm sharing this illustration again. Um, I heard it was useful and I wanted to share a better copy of it. 
Um, just a reminder that contacts of contacts are not contacts and you don't have to notify them. They don't need to be in quarantine. Um, so I know that's really a, an issue that comes up quite a bit. <clears throat> I also went through and I borrowed some images from those toolkits from Oregon and did some copying and pasting here um, just to help better illustrate and demonstrate some things. So basically, if this blue student, which blue is kind of a good color, so the blue student is sick, um, we would work with the school to determine the close context, but most likely it would be everyone within this bullseye here, this red area. So this red student would be a close contact. That individual rode on bus number two, but nobody on this bus is going to have to be in quarantine um, because a contact to a contact is not a concern. If for some reason over the 14 days, this contact becomes ill, then we'll do contact tracing. The odds of a close contact getting ill is anywhere from you know 0% to upwards. For household contacts, it can be up to about 50%. Um, but for classroom contacts, we don't really know the percentage of that, but it's usually quite low. Um, so again, the odds are is that this person will not get sick, so we don't need to worry one bit about these bus um, companions. So hopefully that illustrates it a bit better. Um, and you can feel free and use this if you need to, to help explain it to others. So notification of close contacts and others in the school. Um, so just to clarify, and I clarified this with my three health departments, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, and so we all know who's doing what. So if there is a case, we will work with you and the school will work with us to help identify who those close contacts are. The close contacts are going to need to stay home in quarantine. And so the health department, once you tell us who they are, we will contact them, basically their parents if it's students, but we'll contact them to get proper education. Now, realistically, you know, if that person's at school, you may be contacting them first because you might have to call mom to come pick them up. So we'll call them and educate them as soon as we can. That will be our role, but it might be possible that you get a hold of them first. If that happens, tell them the health department will be calling you, but we should be in touch with them within 24 hours. General notification to the rest of the school will typically be done by you. So we've given you a form letter you can send out. Um, some of you use like general phone blasts or texts or Facebook or however you prefer to do it because that, that will typically be much quicker. We are happy to provide you with a similar form letter on our letterhead if you would prefer, but that may take longer. So basically we'll notify the close contacts you will notify everybody else that you feel should be notified. Um, and if we, if you want to do anything differently, just work with us and we'll do that. Um, so again, if there's any confusion or, or um, you need or want to do anything differently than that, just let us know. We did find out that the state does plan to start listing the names of schools. Um, that have had outbreaks and identify them on the state website starting next week. Um, this was not our decision, that was the state's decision. Um, <clears throat> and so for us, you know, an outbreak will most likely be defined as two or more confirmed cases that have developed within 14 days of each other that are linked through the school only. So they've been in the same classroom, they've been somehow connected to each other within the school, they are not in the same household, they, you know, aren't on the same Boy Scout troop, they, you know, don't have some other common connection that could have been the source besides school. Um, so we want to be really sure that we're only reporting outbreaks that we know for positive positive are from their interactions at the school. Now, handling six students, I mentioned this earlier, um, 
when we went through your numbers. But if you look at page seven of the toolkit, there's this box here after you have symptoms. You know, if someone's sick, you need to get them out of school. But then the risk factors for COVID, have they had contact with COVID? Have they traveled internationally? Um, or do they live in areas with higher levels of COVID, which again, I said was that levels one through three risk level. Um, so that's where we then see this table, which I just went over, um, is basically the orange and reds. If you are listed in any of these areas, you would consider yourself to have higher levels. You certainly can say, I don't know what this kid has been doing. I don't know where they've been going. I don't want to have to worry about it. So any kid with any of these symptoms, I'm not even going to, I'm just going to skip this box and go right over here. And they all have to be evaluated before they can come back. The reason for this one is this is what's recommended by the CDC. The other was just to keep, to try and minimize how many kids have to stay home for 10 days um, when they might not have to. So hopefully that's a little more clear and a little easier. The alternative would be um, using this uh, set of flow sheets. It's from Oregon. Again, it's really, really detailed. It is like 20 pages long. Um, this is just one, one tiny part of that flow sheet. So this would say, okay, if you have a student who becomes ill um, and they've not had any known contact with anybody who's sick, and then it goes through what you would do with the school, what you would do with the sick person, and what you would do with their household members. And then with the sick person, it goes through if they have a negative test, if they didn't get tested, and if they're positive. So if they if they didn't get tested, you'd go to scenario 4A. So 4A um, says, okay, if they have respiratory symptoms, they need to stay out for 10 days. If there's no alternative diagnosis available, they need to stay out for 10 days. If a doctor has given an alternative diagnosis um, for their illness, like a bladder infection or something, they can come back once, you know, they've been fever free, et cetera, et cetera. So, it also goes through then what to do if they have been in close contact with somebody. So it has just tons of pages like this. So it really walks you through step by step. It has flow sheets for if they've been exposed, if you know, all that. So it's it's a bit more aggressive than our flow sheet because you can see then that people might be out for 10 days. Um, but you can certainly see this as an alternative. <clears throat> If you want some guidance, kind of walking through all these scenarios, because I know there are a lot of scenarios that can come up. So those were all of my updates. Um, again, just addressing the questions and issues we've had come up over the past week. Um, so I will open it up for questions now. Thanks, Dr. Morse. We'll go to the chat box. We can see there's already several questions there. Um, and we'll begin. The first one that's listed says, can you please review travel by airplane? If a staff member flies to Texas on an airplane, are they required, recommended to quarantine? So at this time, there are no official recommendations regarding domestic travel. Um, last week, I did share some guidance if you chose to do anything, and um, I kind of saw that being typed in before we started. So let me do do do. So last week, um, this was my PowerPoint from last week. <clears throat> So for domestic travel, again, there's no specific recommendations. If you wish, there's a website called globalepidemics.org and they have nice a nice map. You can look either at all of the counties in the US or just the states in the US. If there's an orange or red state, those are states that have really high um, ongoing incidence of COVID. If you want to set some kind of parameters 
at your school, like your HR department decides that's a good idea, you can choose to do that. But that would be your own choice. And I encourage people to talk to their HR director and lawyer about that. Um, but currently, there are no official guidelines. I know um, we continue to watch for those. But that would be kind of dependent on your preferences at your facility. Okay. Next question says, when specifically do we need to have students that have one symptom go mm -hmm. to the doctor according to the mystartmap.com data? So again, um, let me pull up our flow chart here. So if you go to your flow chart, if your student has a fever over 100.4 or they have signs of a fever, if they have a sore throat, if they have a new uncontrolled cough that's causing shortness of breath, if they have diarrhea, vomiting, or abdominal pain, or if they have a new sudden severe headache, which I know that one's a little bit difficult, um, and you are in a county that is in the medium high, high or very high risk for community spread, those individuals should be evaluated by a physician and or be tested for COVID. So that flow sheet is in the toolkit on page seven. Dr. Morse, can I ask for a little more clarification on that? Mm -hmm. So when I go there, um, and, and we had some conversation um, through one of your employees yesterday, um, I'm, we were told yesterday, we're looking at the test results for our county for positive tests. And that's the number we should be looking at to make that determination. But I feel like you shared with us, we should be looking at new cases and the category that we log in there. So I'm just looking for clarification sure. of which data we're supposed to be choosing to make, make that decision. Yeah, and I know I've talked to a few nurses this week about that question. And so my there's two different indices from that map. There's the percent positive and then there's the cases per million. Um, in terms of like a student's risk for exposure, my feeling is better safe than sorry. And so my feeling would be if you have either one of those indices in the medium high to very high category, it's best to assume, okay, our community spread could be high enough that this student could have And I'm hoping that that makes sense. It does. So just, just to be clear, if either one of those numbers places in medium high, high or very high, we should be suggesting go to the doctor, consider a test. And if you choose not to quarantine for 10 days before returning. That would be my suggestion. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Much appreciated. Yep. And I'm sorry. I know this has been a really confusing week and some of the things that have come up are things that I wasn't, you know, you don't know until it comes up. And so that's why I'm trying to trying to be more specific now. So I apologize. No apology necessary. We 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 got hit with that yesterday and we didn't know where to go. And um and I know it's all new for you too. So we just appreciate the clarification today. All right, next question. Governor Whitmer just changed the symptoms list last week. Will the health department then revise the employee screening form? Well, our employee screening form was made with the guidance of the state based on what they changed the My Symptoms app screener to. So I was not aware that they had made any other changes, but ours was specifically made with guidance from the state. So I guess I'll have to look into that and see what they did to it. <clears throat> the symptoms didn't change, Doc. It was the, um, you know, the 
that one executive order that caused all the confusion about whether people needed to stay home and whether it was one symptom or two symptoms, that's what changed. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so the, the symptoms that we use are the same ones that trigger someone to be told to stay at home if they're using the state's My Symptoms Tracker app. Um, and so my assumption is, is it's still the same as that. But Penny, if there's something different, um, feel free to email me and I'll look into it. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Morris. I, I will take a look at the EO and then ask. Someone else had asked that question of me also, so I will get some clarification and ask, ask you if I need to. I Great. appreciate it. Okay. Yep, no problem. I can't keep up with all the eels. <laughs> I understand. <clears throat> all right, we'll move on to the next question. When looking at Isabella County case per million, uh, does this include the population of the students plus the true population or just the true population of Isabella County? That is a really good question, and I never thought of that. So, um, the student cases are being counted as Isabella County cases because they occurred there. But as you know, the majority of them are actually residents of another county. So no, they're not counted. So when you're looking at your denominator of the county population, no, they're not part of that. So that is a good point. Um, you know, it's only an extra 200 or 300 people. Um, but you know the huge amount of extra population that comes in with university every year is not counted in that population. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that that is a good point. So we're counting cases as our county's cases, but they're not be they're not part of our county's population. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. If a person goes out of the state for the weekend, do they need to quarantine when they return? There are no guidelines to that effect. So again, only if your organization decides to make those guidelines, but there's no public health guidelines for that, so no. Okay. Okay. So I apologize. It's the weather is pretty bad here. It's raining and I keep dropping off. So if, if I'm silent, somebody else pick up. <laughs> um, mean, do you want me to read the questions and just go through them? Sure. That, that way, if I drop off, they'll at least hear you. Okay. Um, next question. How long should we maintain paper copies of completed employee health screening forms? I honestly do not know the answer to that question. Um, health officers or someone might know that just from an employee standpoint, but that would be something I'd consult with HR with about. Um, but I don't know someone the answer to that. Answered that question. It looks like further down too. Okay. Um, Dave Cox said uh, the set seg has recommended seven years for liability purposes. So perfect. Good. Yeah, I don't know. Every, I don't know much about employee issues. So good. Um, if a parent tells a school they themselves are getting a COVID test, do we, the school, have the right to ask if it was positive? Um, if yes, then do we, the school, need to ask the student to stay home? You <clears throat> you can ask. I mean, they don't necessarily have to tell you. Um, we're trying really hard to make sure we notify schools of who in your school should be on quarantine and who should not be. Um, but your parents should be telling you if their child has been exposed. If you have questions, um, you can call us and we can check and see if someone is positive. 
we can't tell you if they are or they aren't, but then we can tell you if you have a student in your school who should be on quarantine. So that's kind of the roundabout way of doing it if needed. Um, but in terms of, you know, your rights, you, you can ask them whatever you want to ask them. I mean, I'm sure they have the right of telling you that they don't have to tell you. But again, if, if you have concerns that a student shouldn't be in your class because they're a contact, give us a call. We can look into it. We may not be able to verify if someone is positive or isn't positive, but we can tell you if, if you have someone in your school who should not be. Um, questions about indoor swimming pools. Executive order prohibits the opening of indoor swimming pools in our region. However, the state website provides an exemption for pools to be opened for infant and children drowning prevention. Some counties have allowed for infant and child swimming lessons to take place in the name of drowning prevention. We offer a part of our curriculum swimming classes in sixth, seventh, and eighth with a focus on drowning prevention as part of the curriculum. I'm told that swimming classes are not to happen, but I'm wondering, I don't know the answer to that. And I don't know if Steve might know that or if one of our EH directors might know the answer to that. Hey, Doc, this is Liz. Oh, hi. Hey, Braddock with um, Environmental Health with Mid-Michigan. There is an exemption for um, for swimming for drowning. Yes, that is correct. So it doesn't list a age. It just says children. So would they be able to have their swimming lessons then you think or the swimming classes? Yes, they would. I can send the FAQ information forward to you, Doc, and you can share it with the group. OK, thank you. We currently have staff who've made plans to travel out of state or internationally. Um, so again, I shared that on my talk last week. Um, let me see if I can. I'm going to put that slide. Oop. <clears throat> trying to think the best way to do this. So for international travel, the CDC has a list of countries that are high risk and anyone traveling to those countries should quarantine for 14 days. Anyone who's traveled internationally or domestically as well, if they've done anything high risk, which is um, being in an area of high levels of COVID, going to a large social gathering, attending a mass gathering, being in crowds, or traveling on a cruise ship or river boat um, should take extra precautions. Um, and that could include staying home. So again, it's not an official recommendation, but you could consider that. Um, and then again, the guidance, if you want to make it a policy that people who go to high risk states stay in quarantine, um, the best map that I found to help you with that um, was the globalepidemics.org. Um, but again, if there's not a universal blanket recommendation for quarantine after international travel anymore, it's based on the risk level of the country. And that link is, um, it's cdc.gov slash coronavirus slash 2019 dash and COV slash travelers, et cetera, et cetera. So if you go to the, the coronavirus website and you click on travelers, you can find it. Plus it was in my PowerPoint from last week, which is on our websites. It was slide five, has all that information. So we should be using the new cases data. Okay, so I think we talked about that already. So yeah, I would, and again, I'm sorry for being wishy-washy, but um, for the sake of being as safe as possible in terms of triaging your six students, I think it would be best to use both data points um, to determine your community spread. Oh, I'm supposed to say a huge thank you to Jamie Shepler. So I'll pass it on to her. Our nurses, I know, have been working really hard with the schools. 
Um, and we appreciate your patience. I know this has been a bumpy ride for all of us. What number should we call if we have a question after the health departments have closed for the day? Um, so one thing is, is that um, if it can wait till the next working day, then wait till the next working day. So many things we think are emergencies aren't. Um, but other than that, all of our health departments have emergency numbers and your school should know that, your superintendent should know that. And if not, then if you go to our websites, which is either mmdhd.org, cmdhd.org, or dhd10.org, depending on which health department you're, you're residing in, they all have a contact us page. Um, and all of them have an emergency after our number listed. We plan to have students in K through five wear masks all day. Can you, can they take them off on the playground if they're mixing with children from other classes? Technically, no, because they're mixing with other classes. Um, if they can stay with their class cohort, or if they can stay six feet apart or more than they can. So in Isabella County, if we have a child with a high fever or other symptoms, they should go to the doctor or have a COVID test, correct? Yes, that is correct. I think that is all the questions we have right now on the chat. Um, more, please enter them in or feel free to go off of mute and ask. Or if anyone um, would like to, like last time, wants to share anything that they've learned or experienced since school. Or if there's anything you would like us to know to make things work out better happy to hear. I would always love to hear that. Dr. Morris, this is Janine. I got a call from a parent today about her son um, was wearing a gator neck cover or face covering and was told by the school that that's not an appropriate face covering. I just want to see if you can, you know, I know there's been back and forth questions about gators. She said that hers, um, you know, was re recommended for her son who has asthma and anxiety, and um, it 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 filters dust. And it it had a list of things about the gator uh, neck face covering. So, is there any more guidance you can give about gators? Um, I, I mean, the schools can set their own policies and rules. Um, I think we've discussed that. They fit the definition of a face covering. Um, whether or not, I mean, they're likely not as effective as other masks, but there's likely other masks out there that are not as effective. So, um, but they officially meet the definition of a face covering. Again, schools can set whatever policies and procedures they would like to follow. Um, I would encourage them to be consistent and have them in writing, um, but, I think we've said that before that they, you know they fit they fit the criteria. Um, so, but just like you know, workplaces, other places, um, you know, the schools have the right to make their own decisions about that. Thanks, Dr. Morris. I did yeah. tell her that it's ultimately up to the school and their yeah. policy. Well, we will get those numbers out and post everything like usual. And if there's anything else, make sure and let us know. There oh. is one more question, there, Dr. Morris. Are folks from the health department willing to come out and do a walkthrough with the school district? We have made plans. The situation is ever changing. Um, I don't know if we have the staff capacity to do that. Um, that would be something 
probably have to contact the local branch office to see if anyone has availability to do that, or we'd have to play powwow about that. But um, we are very strapped right now for time and staff. But I mean, it's something we could talk about. Yeah. Yeah, and I think to Doc's point, um, individually, the, the office can, we could discuss that if you're interested in that, but we are completely <laughs> overwhelmed right now with, with case investigation, contact tracing, and then on top of that, now we've got a plan for flu clinics and, and things uh -huh. like that, so we are definitely, as a health department, strapped. Yep. All right. Any other questions, comments, sharing, feedback, concerns? If not, we'll give you back 10 minutes of your day. All right, guys, hang in there. Keep working hard.